Well, I'm glad to be here too. <laughs> um, you know, it's, well, you know, some of you may know, some may not know. Actually, I am typically chairing Freedom Incorporated meetings uh, on the third Thursday as well. So I think I have kind of, you know, designated someone else to kind of do that while I'm here this evening. But I'm glad to be here. Yes, I am. I'm typically I'm the I'm the person who runs the meeting, the monthly uh, meetings every month. So, um, so it is. It is good to be here. Um, I think you want to kind of an update. So for those that don't know, at the state, we typically are in session from January through May every year. So this happens to be the off session and we'll be going back in January. Um, so we don't have a whole lot to report, obviously because we're out of session right now, um, with the exception of the fact that I think this year two of our bigger issues, of course, is going to be Medicaid expansion and the school transfer issue with the Kansas City and the surrounding school districts. Um, you know, this education piece, this education issue is a very difficult issue because it's extremely emotional. You know, the folks in Kansas City feel one way, another faction in Kansas City feels another way, the folks in the surrounding districts sometimes feel, you know, a different way, and it becomes um, very difficult for us sometimes as legislators just wanting to make, you know, the right decisions and, and wanting everyone, of course, to be happy with those decisions that are made. But, um, um, it, it's going to be an interesting year, I think, as far as the social transfer <coughs> piece is uh, concerned. I think um, one of the main concerns in Kansas City, of course, for some folks in Kansas City, is that um, Kansas City doesn't face this whole bankruptcy issue, um, you know, with students potentially leaving the district, of course, with transfers. Now, what has happened in St. Louis, they've had two districts, and I don't know if you guys have followed it, but there are two districts in St. Louis. Um, who had student transfers this year. Both of them are facing bankruptcy because of the number of students, of course, that have gone to the surrounding, to the neighboring districts. And um, many of us in Kansas City, of course, are wanting to avoid that. Um, I know there's some concern among the neighboring districts of some of those students, of course, um, then transferring into those neighboring districts as well. Um, so it becomes a sticky issue for us, um, really, to say the least. I mean, there are those folks um, it was interesting because I was having a conversation with one of the representatives the other day and he was like, Kiki, I'm hearing all these folks now or some of these folks, you know, these folks are, you know, we're saying we don't want the transfers because we don't want the bankruptcy of the district, but these folks are saying they want the transfers. Their kids shouldn't have to stay there if they feel kids aren't being educated. And, and so it becomes a really um, emotional issue for a lot of folks and it, it becomes very stressful for us just kind of wanting to do the right thing and making sure we're making the right decisions for, you know, all the folks, of course, that we represent. So, um, <clears throat> I don't know what the thought is or whether there happen to be any thoughts tonight on this whole transfer issue. Um, let me say this. I do want everyone to know here, whether I can make it to the monthly meetings or not, generally, of course, because of my, you know, other chairman and the other, uh, chair in the other meetings, I want to be accessible. I really, really do. That's what I'm here for. Richard, you can call me anytime. Um, I think that what's most important um, is really for you to know that I really have great intentions and I really want to be here to serve. Really, I do. I, I think that's, in, that's important. I think, um, so just when I say give me a call, if you need something, if there's something you need help with, always, 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 that's what I'm here for. I mean it. I don't just say it, I actually mean it. So, um, I think those are two of the largest things that we have to be concerned about, of course, uh, this legislative year. I think it's going to be a hard year. It's an election year for a lot of folks. It doesn't have to be, it's not an election year for me. I don't run again for three more years. But for many of the state reps, of course, that are running, um, it's going to be a difficult year when we talk about um, uh, some of those real important issues that probably will not get passed um, you know during an election year for folks that are afraid to um, vote or take a stand on one side or the other because of their constituency so it'll be to say the least it'll be a very interesting difficult year this year <laughs> in a number of ways so um, you guys have any questions anything I got a question sure um, <laughs> So, I guess I'm 
Sure. I mean, there's a lot of good teachers in the mm -hmm. Kansas City Public School District, right. and there's a lot of good support staff, and there is kids that are leaving the Kansas City school system mm -hmm. that have gotten good educations. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, I, what is the rationale between like taking everybody and just shifting them around to different um, school districts? Because a lot of this has to do, in my opinion, and from what I've been told by people in certain neighborhoods that surround these schools, that a lot of it's environmental. And so, um, you know, if you have a kid going to school hungry, he's probably not going to do that great academically, regardless of whether he's in at least some at Raytown or Kansas City. Here's what I'll say. I'll say that there are a bunch of good teachers, of course, and a lot of good support staff in the city, of course. Um, I think that a lot of those, a lot of the issues surrounding a lot of the kids, as you say, happen to be something more social. Not necessarily that the kids just aren't learning when they get to class, but you know what? This is really, this whole issue of education, especially in urban areas, is very much a multifaceted, very complicated issue. Because it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this, and for it to work, all of these things have to work in sync. And if they're not working in sync, then the system is kind of broken. But there are a number of things. I mean, when you talk about um, socioeconomic issues, you know, before kids get to class, the whole um, issue with kids being able to um, eat potentially before they get to school and you also have to talk about a system that's been broken for such a long time that if we're expecting kids parents to be able to help them with homework and the parents can't read that you know that's that's that whole double jeopardy thing for the kids through no fault of their own potentially I mean it's a very complex issue um, there are a bunch of things that need to be addressed not just um, things in the district and not just the teachers and you know we have this whole thing with teacher evaluations and teacher tenure and and some of these other things, but when we talk about this whole Medicaid expansion thing, and we're talking about, you know, folks that can't get health insurance, and I mean, it's really a very complicated issue for why some of these things are going on, and not just one single factor, which is true. And I think you alluded to that earlier. I think um, it's very complicated. And it's interesting because even in my service at the state, for folks that have a lot of experience in education, I mean, they all have different ideas as to what really will make the system work, you know? And some things, apparently, some things work well in certain areas of the country and other things don't work well. And, you know, we had the whole thing when we had the, uh, 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 the mayor wanting to oversee the district. And then we had, you know, whether we should cut up the district in a bunch of different pieces and, and that whole thing. But um, I will tell you the school transfer piece, you know, you were asking why they were thinking that they, the kids should be able to just go in a bunch of different areas. I think that's what you asked. Mm -hmm. But in statute, it said that there is, if there is an unaccredited district, then those kids in that district should have the opportunity to be able to transfer to a better performing district. And so that's where we are. I mean, you know, our district, of course, has become unaccredited because of some legal um, things going on, of course, with the surrounding district, we haven't actually had to address the actual transfer issue yet, but it's impending, for sure, and the likelihood is that it could be over the next couple months that we'll be facing this whole transfer issue. You had a question? Well, I think that at least my concerns, and I think I've heard them from, from others, mm -hmm. is three, three areas. One, if the kids do transfer into the Raytown district, we at least get what our cost reimbursed for what our cost per per student is mm -hmm. and not the 3700 or whatever that, that the KC school district offered. Our real cost is somewhere around close to $9,000 and they have a real cost of $17,000. Uh, so Who has 17? I think the total reimbursed cost per student in the KC district is 16 or 17,000 a year. I think it's I think it's 12 or 13, I believe. It could be, two, you know, we've heard a couple okay. of things. But one, despite what it is. One, it doesn't isn't a financial burden for us, okay? Two, it isn't a facilities burden. We don't get more students than we can adic adequately right. absorb. that's one of the issues. And the third one is if this splitting of the district happens and Raytown gets a piece of the KC district that the tax revenues for education 
are averaged for the whole of the Kansas City so that we don't just end up with east side property supporting our school systems and center gets the plaza right you know uh, we want to be able to educate all our students if that's if those students if the amount of students increases we don't want the problems without the money right I understand that. well the way the statute is written right now the the school the unaccredited school district has to pay the tuition of the receiving school district okay so you wouldn't lose money now of course we've got the issue in st louis where i think you know i think last month or a few weeks ago they said well um you know we know we owe this money but we're not going to pay this money right now but then of course the state had to step in and tell them they they better pay it <laughs> or they're going to take the money out of their um, um allotment through the formula of course so um it's interesting in Kansas City because we're kind of in this whole learning process. We're kind of watching what's going on in St. Louis just so that we can kind of figure out what potentially is down the road for us. Um, but it's, you know, the, the, the problem is, and it is interesting because the unfortunate thing is that you have a bunch of kids in a district for whatever reason that are not getting what they need to be successful. And I understand the emotion behind that for a lot of the parents, especially for those parents that may be trying and those parents that may you know, have to work multiple jobs and they still feel like, um, yeah, you know, there's always a lot of blame to go around. You know, of course, you know, you have folks at the district say, well, the parents need to really pick it up. And then the parents are like, well, yeah, but I'm doing what I need to do, but it's the teachers that need to pick it up. And, you know, the district needs to do this, and there need to be more resources for us, and all those other things. And those things are true. You know, they do. We really, 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 of course, in some areas, need more resources, you know, for those families to be able to feel supported and be successful and all those other things. But, but <clears throat> you know, therein lies part of the issue, and which is why it's a very complicated issue. It's not just a cut and dry, you know, uh, you know, how do you make how do you make it so the kids can be successful? And it's a very, very complicated thing for us. And um, you know, I, you know, there's no golden ticket and there's no silver bullet to that whole thing. But it does have to, you know, in deciding what happens there, there needs, there's a lot of consideration that has to be taken, of course, for those neighboring school districts and the things that they feel they would need or don't need or want or don't want in that whole process as well. So. Um, it's complicated and it's stressful. <laughs> okay, I can tell you since we've been dealing with this whole deaccreditation thing of the Kansas City School District, they have been two of the more the most stressful sessions that I've had because there's so much emotion. I mean, you go to these neighborhood meetings, and these folks over here are really angry because they're doing this, and these folks are really angry because they're not doing this. And folks are like, "We need to support the school board," and those folks are like, "No, get rid of the school board. We don't need the school board." And you're kind of like, "What to do?" You know. But there is a very emotionally charged discussion everywhere we go, very much so. So, um, you know, those are one of the things, of course, that are going to have to be addressed this year. I will tell you that one of the things that several of the folks in Jeff City happen to be looking at on the Senate side, as well as myself, is potentially accrediting individual schools. So in that, those folks in the district would have at least some idea of those schools that are performing, you know, to be able to give them a grade A through F, those that are performing, those that are not performing, and those that are somewhere in the middle. And for those schools that are not performing, given the opportunity for those students to stay within the district for the most part, but at least have the opportunity to go to, you know, different schools, and they just they'll just have to bust them to those um, other schools that happen to be performing as well. So the challenge to that is, you know, as you mentioned earlier, is capacity. You know, if you have 200 kids in a school that only holds 300 kids and you know you can't send 400 extra kids to that school so um, so you know therein lies one of the are the school districts where, going to be able to determine what kids they take and they look at their academic <coughs> abilities and, and pick and choose they're not supposed to do that <laughs> but here's what I'll say too on the st. Louis side it was interesting because those students by the time they were able to apply for the transfer i think it was only like a month or a month and a half before like the deadline so really the only most of the students that transferred were the parents who happened to be more informed of what's going on 
So, but it almost happened to be like almost a third of the students. But when you think about the number of students that left that first year, because it happened to be the parents that were probably even more either involved or most informed of the process, think about the following year how many other potential students could then leave as well for those parents that just didn't get it or didn't fill out paperwork or just weren't paying attention. And do they have to take the kids that are discipline issues in schools they're in now? <clears throat> yes. I believe. <laughs> and, and then what's, I mean, I don't know. What, My what the criteria? I that? think they actually have to take, which, is, which was part of the issue. Uh -huh. They really are supposed to take all of the students, any student that applies to that district. Well, you know if you don't have enough room to be able to accept an extra 500 kids, then you just can't accept an extra 500 kids, which is why some of those other legal issues, of course, developed out of this, this thing, too. So, um, you know, does the reality... That, does that, I'm sorry, does that trump the Safe Schools Act? Because currently districts don't have to take students who have been they have the option of not taking students who have been expelled under the Safe it could, Schools Act. You know what? It could potentially be correct, and now that he's asked that question, and now that you've said that, I'm going to find out for sure. My understanding is to the statute is that any student that who's applies, eligible. who's eligible, yes, that they would be able to transfer them to the other So district. it's comparable to the charter requirements, that they take anyone who lives within the catchment area who's eligible for a seat they have open. I don't... I think it necessarily has to be within a certain area. I mean, in those districts in... But within in, the Kansas City District. I'm and sorry. Who's geographically inside the Kansas City District. <clears throat> those students that are geographically within the Kansas City School District would have the opportunity to transfer out to one of the neighboring to districts. District. Right. One of my concerns, and it's not raised by many, is a lot of these, quote, solutions will result in the disenfranchisement of a lot of Kansas City parents, be it their kids are going to a district where they don't vote on the school board or their schools will be managed by a school board that they have no vote right. on. And that's, one that's a b basic democratic principle mm -hmm. that, that's at risk here right. is disenfranchising a lot of your Kansas City voters. Right. I agree. That that's one of the issues, of course, that have been talked that you know we talked about in Jefferson City too, and and um, I know. It, I mean, it's 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 really it's it's just really it's really complicated, and it's really frustrating, and just trying to decide what's best to make sure at least that you're able to meet in the middle where if everyone can't be happy, at least folks feel as if they've at least negotiated something where they at least feel you know okay. I like buying a car. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be like that. <laughs> if if they have these students that are coming in from Kansas mm -hmm. City or wherever, mm -hmm. um, how are they supposed to get here? Um, we don't have enough buses in Macon. Kansas City. The Kansas City School, school district, district would be responsible for busing the students. You're sure of that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That district has to pay the tuition and uh, expense for busing uh, to those neighboring districts. Oh, it is, which is why, um, it's, yeah, which is yeah. not, it's the, which is why the issue is not just the tuition for those other districts that have to send the kids. I mean, they're facing bankruptcy because they also have to, yes, yeah, the whole transportation issue as well. And it's not necessarily just to the district that, you know, I mean, and I think in St. Louis, um, they can choose to bus directly I think to one district then they have to pay for busing I think for the for the for the others or something mm -hmm. but but you know it's just I'm not looking forward to this session for a number <laughs> of reasons <laughs> uh, you know I think one being of course because I happen to be you know we happen to be Democrats in a legislature that's mostly Republican but um, you know but these issues are very um, very emotionally charged for us, not just at home, but it, in Jeff City too. So, you know, our, our, our jobs, uh, you know, they're not easy right now, but it comes with it. And, um, you know, so if any of you have any thoughts and need to call our offices at any time, and it's like, no, what are you guys doing? We need, <laughs> need this. I mean, you know, that's what we're here for. We hear it all the time. Too. I was going to say, speaking of Republicans, on a sort of related issue, there mm -hmm. are those in the state legislature who clearly think public education has failed and it's time 
to outsource it. So they're in favor of expanding charters. They're in favor of vouchers for and tax credits for, for mm -hmm. private schools. Uh, are we likely to see the same players bringing that, that legislation forward again this year? I, I think mean, it keeps so. getting defeated, but it keeps coming. It back. does. I will say that yes. So the answer, the short answer, of course, is yes, probably. I don't know if we'll see as much on the uh, the charter issue. The charter issue for sure. Because there are folks, of course, that are, um, let me back up. The charter issue for sure. The voucher issue probably to some degree. And the voucher, you know, I don't know if you guys know, but you guys know about vouchers. Everybody does. Okay. Sometimes I don't want to assume, you know, that everybody does and you have the folks that um, don't necessarily. But um, I think the... Charter issues, certainly. Now, you know, we've already passed legislation, I believe it was not this year, last year, that allowed charters, of course, um, around the rest of the state and not just in Kansas City and, and St. Louis, of course. But um, I think there will be a move, probably, to increase some of the charters or at least be able to move some of those students probably to those charters that happen to be performing. And, you know, the voucher issue, I think that's a very real concern. Um, the queen of the vouchers historically had been Jane Cunningham, who, of course, was turned out last year, two years ago. So, um, yes, I know. <laughs> but, More cigar um, smoke. But, you know, but, I mean, Tim Jones on the House side, you know, he happens to be supportive of it, who's the Speaker of the House, and there are the folks over there who, who are. But... At this point, it just, it, it really, um, it's disheartening. I think, you know, for many of us, it's still, you know, just wondering what the best decision is and, you know, what do you do for kids that through no fault of their own are really caught up in a system that's not being productive for them. And, you know, the Kansas City, you know, school district scores, I think, you know, they kind of, touted what a great job they did and it's good that there was some improvement in some areas you know but when you have improvements um, in things such as um, you know maybe a fiscal audit or a governance structure and those things are important but they're not important to parents who are wanting their kids to you know what I mean yeah to read so um, so there was you know a slight increase in um, uh, math and science and um, social studies you know, but there were no points, of course, given in communication arts. And, you know, the reality is, and some parents are very valid in saying, you know, a kid can use a calculator for the rest of their life, but if they can't, if they never learn to read, they're just screwed. You know, which is true. So, um, you know. Well, and they don't test everything every year, so you don't really have... Which is... A <coughs> consistent measuring is part stick. of the problem, yeah. And, and the transience of the kids, that they move from one building to another to another, makes right. it really hard to attribute their failure or success to a teacher or a district right. or a particular building because they've been in six different elementary schools over their six years. Which is honestly part of the reason I think when we, if, if we're, a, if they're able to do something, which is why that whole thing with the accrediting the individual schools may be something that's, you know, worth really, really talking about. Because if you know that you have schools where the students are not doing as well, you know, it really allows at least the district to be able to kind of focus in hopefully on those schools and kind of give extra attention to those schools. You know, maybe there's some other resources that are needed or other, you know, professional development or some other things or maybe there are just other community resources that are needed at the school too to help those kids be successful. And so maybe instead of there being just a blanket accreditation process, then it would at least allow probably the superintendent or the administration to be able to zero in on those specific schools you know, that, um, you know, that are not performing as well. So, um, if anybody has the golden ticket <laughs> or the silver bullet to this whole thing, just share it. So, um, so I think that's where we are um, with the transfer issue. I think, uh, you know, when we talk about Medicaid expansion, there was a very interesting thing, I think, that went on in the House, I think, this week. They had a committee hearing, and I think the governor had, you know, invited a bunch of the Democrats, um, um, to talk to him about Medicaid expansion, and you know, I think the re the chair part of the <coughs> chairs of the committees then sent a letter to the governor saying, "You want to talk to us about Medicaid expansion? Then you need to come to the hearing and you know address us in the chair." 
which is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> to expect the governor to have to testify, um, you know, if you're wanting to talk to the committee about Medicaid expansion. So, you know, I think needless to say, the governor didn't take too kindly with the demands that were being made by them. Well, the request, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of a situation that's kind of developing. I think that, you know, they just sent him the letter, and I think either yesterday, was it David? Or yesterday, that he then said, no, you know, I'm not going to sit there during a hearing and have to testify at a hearing to be able to talk to the legislators about Medicaid expansion. So we'll have to see, um, you know, of course, where that goes next couple of days or the next week. So we'll see what happens. But outside of that, we're hoping, I'm still hoping, there's something we can get done on Medicaid expansion. You know, I mean, it, just the, the loss of revenue to the state and for those, what, 200 something thousand folks that, I mean, it's 100% funded by the federal government. I, I honestly do not see any reason for why. It's ideological. <sighs> it's right wing nut job ideology. It, it is, it, it is, you know, but we had the whole discussion. It's like, they said, oh, well, the problem is, but you know what the reality is? Is that a lot of the Republicans we've talked to, especially over on the Senate side, actually are not opposed to the expansion. I mean, it's just, it's a party thing that, you know, they're fighting with right now. There are a few of the folks in their, you know, party that are really kind of putting a lot of pressure on the rest of the folks. But over on the Senate, of course, we, we have quite a few moderates that really want something done. You know, I mean, even the Senate president said, I think last year, you know, we're going to, you know, figure out how we can do something. It may not be everything, but we want to do something. And um, so I'm still hoping, you know, that once that Their party's so dysfunctional, they can't do anything because uh, they get hit from the right. Oh. From the, the wacko right, even further the right wackos. than they are right now. That's it. So you're, unfortunately, you're dealing with their internal politics until that oh, breaks sure. open and something settles, yeah. like until they get a backbone and kick out the nut jobs, yeah. you won't be able to deal with them. Yeah, and we had, you know, several of them, I think, even during our budget hearings, you know, we said, how can we not support this? I don't get it. And they said, mm -hmm. well, because, Kiki, you know what, we say it's going to be in three years, and three years, if we decide to cut them off, then you guys are just, you know, the governor and everybody's going to say it's the Republicans, because, you know, we hold the majority in the House and Senate. And I'm like, if I were a person without insurance, and they also use mm -hmm. the argument that we don't need to put people on and then have to cut them off. If I didn't have insurance, then just tell me you're going to give it to me for three years. You know, at least let me go and get everything I need done. <laughs> know that I've got to get it done within the next exactly. three years. And if you tell me you're going to cut it off, just tell yeah. me it's for three years. And, you know, it not that we'll like it, but it's better than never having it at all. But aren't, aren't the feds going to still pick up 90% of it after, after the, the three years? After the three years, yes. Yeah. For the first three years, it's 100%. <laughs> after that, it's 90%. We're still saying no. And we're still paying to some degree. We're still paying for someone else to take the money and the services yeah. when we don't. Well, not only that, but... We're paying for emergency yeah, room exactly. treatment of the poor. Yeah. And the people yeah. that would benefit the most have elected the people that are saying no. I know. <laughs> yeah. It's the craziest, craziest thing to me. Well, it also isn't it the case that a lot of those folks that you end up dealing with are rural. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. from rural That's districts. What I mean. Those are the people uh -huh. that need and it they're the most. Oh, they're they're they are the people that need it the absolute yeah, most. Right. There are more they're, folks they're, in the rural the areas that need they're, the services. Yeah. Yeah than the folks in the yeah. urban areas. Now the percentage is higher in the urban areas, but the number is not. Mm. Right, you had a question.